It should have just notified you that we're recording. I did. I, I consented to All whatever right. it is you want to do here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, obviously, this is the inaugural episode of a potential Sword and Planet podcast that we're wanting to do. Uh, I'm Gregor Driscoll. This is James Hansen. We're uh, hello, hello. longtime buddies. Uh, both have an avid interest in the Sword and Planet genre. And we're just going to kind of... genres in general. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean... Potentially, we could go beyond just the sword and planet. There's a lot of different, you know, genres that are interconnected to that sword and sorcery, space opera, et cetera. Jungle adventure. Yep. So we're just going to kind of get our toe in the water here with uh, the first episode. Um, and away we go. Uh, All right. So sword and planet. This is a genre that um, I'll, I'll go ahead and kind of tell you my introduction to the genre. Yeah, definitely. For Kate and Kind. So. Um, you know, when you're first kind of getting into science fiction and fantasy, I think the uh, most common thing for a lot of people to do is just kind of like what's popular now, what's contemporary. I don't know that everyone likes to delve back into the past, which is something that I think both of us really quite enjoy. We, we yeah. like to know what influence the things that, um, we love, you know, so if you love Star Wars and then you read that. George Lucas liked Flash Gordon. He liked um, Kurosawa. He liked World War II aviator movies, yada, yada, yada. We're the kind of guys that would want to go back and see those things rather than just watch the next Star Wars movie. So um, in do with that kind of mentality in mind, one of the names you'd always hear influencing fantasy writers, comic book writers, artists is Edgar Rice Burroughs. And looking back at like things like Star Wars, you'd always hear, you know, oh, well, the Mars series, the Barsoom series, John Carter of Mars. So it seemed inevitable to just go back and read that book. And when I did, um, man, I just had never read anything like it. You know, it was my first experience uh, right off the bat, like kind of the first person perspective of John Carter writing it. It's it's funny because these things would be kind of considered pretty old hat, like, you know, old tropes that have been worn into the ground. But for me, they were totally new. I was about 26, 27 years old. Uh, I read a public domain copy and just that, you know, Burroughs introducing it. Oh, this is a story or this is a book that was given to me by a relative. I have no idea if it's true or not, but this is what I read. You know, just all that stuff was like incredibly like fascinating to me. It drew me right in. And, um, you know, I'm a big sucker for two things, like just that old school heroic fantasy, steel jaw, tough guys. And um you know, just that that world building, you know, um, and looking back, it, it seemed like it must have been one of the earliest examples of detail. It didn't go to that Tolkien level, of course, but it was such a, a detailed world he created in Barsoom. A lot of it improvised, I'm sure. But, uh, you know, you look back to fantasy before that, and I, I'm not sure if there was anything created whole cloth in one book as detailed and rich that wasn't derivative of mythology like Ar or Arthurian legend as uh, Barsoom. So, that was my introduction to the genre. It totally captivated me. And uh, every time I've read a sort of uh, planet book after, I've always kind of hunted for that feeling. But even Burroughs' own work never quite captured it again. Yeah, yeah. Um, for me, um, definitely was introduced to it uh, kind of by accident. Um, I was probably about 10 or 11 years old. Uh, my family moved around a lot. I think at the time I was going to a school in Virginia or North Carolina. I can't really recall which. And it was just one of those sort of things where back in those days, like the schools had subscriptions to comic books. So there might be like piles of comics laying around the library at the school. Uh, there were always like books on the shelves in the back of the classroom. And I always kind of gravitated to the back of the class because I was always a big kid. So, oh, don't sit in front of everyone else. Nobody can see over you. And it was also right. handy because I like to kind of just goof off and draw pictures on my desk or whatever. And I remember I came across a copy of not the first book, but the third book in the series. I came across a copy of Warlord of Mars. It was very definitely uh, the Michael Whalen painted covers. Um, and I want to say, like, when you flipped it over, like the image on the back was John Carter fighting this like giant wasp or something, some kind of and speaking to the connections to, um, you know, Lucas, of course, like the name of the giant wasp is they were called Sith, you know, okay. and th there's a lot of that sort of thing. Like it wasn't until like de a decade or more later where 
especially online, you have people really belaboring these kind of tenuous connections between the franchises, but a Jedak being the leader of like a Martian right. city and a Jedi, you know? Mm-hmm. Right, and, right. Uh, but I just, I remember jumping into it and the story picks up where the cliffhanger from gods of Mars leaves off. So I'm kind of like just immediately thrown into it. I don't really understand like, okay, this is a guy from Earth, he's on Mars, he's in love with this Martian chick who has been uh, captive in this weird sort of rotating prison cell thing where like the cell only opens up like once a year. And that that all seemed very cool to me. That was like, Burroughs, like you said, the world building is key. He come, you know, he comes up with uh, all different kinds of concepts, strange beings, weird creatures, whatever, and that was all right up my alley. I want to say that I read Warlord of Mars before I read Tarzan. And, uh, good you know, and I just, I don't know, I've kind of been hooked on it ever since. I've just always, uh, it's always been something that I've come back to. Um, you know, a little bit later, you know, a few years later, I think is when I really started getting into Flash Gordon. And there are definitely some similarities there. It's a similar sword and planet premise. The Earth man comes to the alien planet and, you know, uh, there's an alien princess. But of course, in Flash Gordon, it's, right. like an, it's an adversarial kind of relationship. Uh, I don't know, man. I, I just uh, burrows for sheer imagination, especially for the time period that he comes from is really unparalleled you know absolutely um i I think you know all due respect to the likes of jack kirby and and tolkien but um probably the most uh, influential and important imagination in um fantasy writing and fantasy creation of the 20th century perhaps you know i'm trying to think of someone that had as big an influence as long and not just on other writers, but artists as well. You know, I mean, he really captured the image. Artists love drawing burrows. Oh yeah, yeah. Look at every great fantasy artist. He, they all want to put their own little spin on burrows. Yeah, and of course, the comparison of the uh, the inspiration that Burroughs had for influencing Siegel and Schuster for Superman. Yeah. You know, and the whole absolutely coming from, a, and, and, coming from a heavier gravity planet, and that's where the super strength comes from. And it was just sort of the inversion of the concept of instead of the the Earth man going to the alien planet, it was the alien coming to Earth. But and which is interesting too. So, Dark Heart of Mars is written in uh, it was like written in maybe 1913 and published in 1916, something along that. It's probably, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, very early. I mean, it's like almost shocking to see that date. You know, when you look back at it, you read the book, you look back at the date, like, holy cow, this was like. This is before the roaring 20s. This is, you know. Right, because Flash Gordon is in the 30s. Superman is in 1938. You know, it's just like, those were decades after uh, John Carter of Mars. John Carter of Mars was written before Great Gatsby. And they teach Great Gatsby in school. (laughs) Right. So, so, you, you know, so what happened there was that the tropes of John Carter of Mars uh, the, the series were so heavily copied and so heavily used that by 19 mid 1930s young science fiction writer Jerry Siegel was like hey this trope is already so well worn let's flip it on its head and have the alien come to earth right to be the superhero so that that's kind of cool and, and uh, let's just take a moment to like look at some of these tropes because one of the things about it's it's not just like that concept of a man wakes up on another planet at, in an alien world it's like people who go into this genre and write in this genre, not only kind of copy that premise, but like so many of the story elements. I'm just gonna go through it here. I haven't written on this word document, but um, you know, the, the protagonist is so often just kind of the, the Captain America, you know, Steve Rogers personality, brave, earnest, honorable, deep romantic. Uh, he always has, it's, it's very convenient for him to be placed on this planet because he has no real attachment to earth. He doesn't have any kids. He doesn't, have he didn't any... fit in. Yeah. Right. He, he's often like a, a wanderer or, or, you know, right. Uh, usually has some experience with fencing for some reason. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. He, he always has an experience with fencing. Um, he's often a soldier. Mm-hmm. Has some sort of background um, in combat. So it kind of gives creed, you know, it, it, you're right there. You see the author, they're kind of setting up that plausibility that even though this guy's, you know, from earth and this is a very warlike culture, he's not like Peter Parker or something. He right. has background and it's plausible for him to be this incredible, 
warrior on this alien world. Um, the, the, the love interest, he almost meets her within the first quarter of the book. She's usually always a member of royalty, often a princess. Yep. And this is like in so many of the stories, you know, he almost never falls in love with a lowly handmaiden. He's always falling in love with someone from royalty. Right. Um, and she's, and it, of course, that first encounter, it's always adversarial. Yeah. She, she's deeply attracted to him, of course. Of course. Yeah. But, but uh, something happens gonna, that always makes it to where she can't like immediately give in. To yeah, there's always place. a custom that he messes up. You know, he doesn't grab his earlobes twice before right. he uses himself. So then she has to hate him for half the book. Right. Something along those lines, you know. Um, <laughs> she's she's princess of a kingdom, but her, her kingdom is in jeopardy. Her, her father, who's brave and honorable, he's delivering some sort of political situation. So, and of course, he's going to be the answer to those problems. Right. Uh, he often, you know, so these are just a few of the, there's so many tropes though. Uh, you know, he'll, he'll, um, there's all, there's like various cultures at war or against each other. He's going to unify them. Yep. Um, barbaric culture and a more civilized culture. You know, he gets the, he gets the Greeks and the barbarians at the gate to be friends, you know? Right. And, the, and there's all, and there's always the key element that I feel of sword and planet is that it's that archetypal image of the sword in one hand and the blaster and the other. Yes. So, you know, that, that's always part of it. Um, of course, like, because I've been dicking around or whatever here, it's trying to tell me the meeting is going to end in 10 minutes. So I'm probably gonna have to restart a new meeting, <laughs> and send you another invite, but that's because it took me a while to get the technical end of this, but the, this is a good start and it'll have recorded this. So, but yeah, it's like, it's the gun in one hand, it's the sword in the other. And like, really that image goes all the way up to, you know, Luke Skywalker and, you know, blaster in one hand, lightsaber in the yeah. other. I mean, and yep. even though that's space opera, there is that sword and planet influence. Um, oh, of course. You know, and you know, uh, George Lucas makes no. Yeah. Yeah. And, before, and you know, Star before the, uh, the star Wars connection was, uh, so you had your kind of bevy of imitators, right? Um, some of like the notable ones throughout time, like Robert E. Howard had one. Yep. What was that one? His name was Almerich. Almerich, right? Yep. Um, gosh, what were some of the ones of the, the golden age here? Well, you know, the, I mean, there there was uh, Gulliver of Mars, which you know some people say is like the predecessor of, right. uh, you know, of like John Carter of Mars. Uh, but my understanding is, is that that was written in more of a Gulliver's Travels kind of style. Right. There was a whimsical tone to it, but some of the similarities are like, like it's all, it seems almost impossible that Burroughs wouldn't have read it, but it, it's, it's kind of an unusual thing. So some of the series, uh, similarities include, um, you know, like the River Is in the John Carter series. There's some mm. really similar where you put your dead in a river. Right. They're not dead yet. And they go down the river and there's just... Um, I can't, I don't have, I, unfortunately for this podcast, it probably would be better if I had the list. Yeah. Um, maybe, but, but the, but the thing is that, 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 doesn't, it, but, um, that doesn't necessarily bother me so much because it's kind of like how you look at the incredible success of say um, Harry Potter. Right. Right. And the thing is, is you can go online and read all of these lists of other similar novels where it's a young boy who's taken to a magical school. Right. And he, right, right. You know, and, and maybe he has glasses and, you know, maybe his parents don't really know he's magical or whatever. So it's not so much that there are predecessors that are similar in nature. It's that for whatever reason, this particular version of that story is what like really sparks the interest in the genre. You know? Well, there's a cliche, you know, it's not the singer, it's the song, or it's not the song, it's the singer. It's not, yeah, the, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's the teller, you know, and when you read those, you know, if, especially if you're a young man, you know, if you read those Sword and Planet books, like I remember just being like, I couldn't stop, I couldn't stop reading it, you know, I just wanted to see what was going to happen next. And, um, you know, it's it's not just what Burroughs, the story Burroughs was telling, it was the way he was telling it. He just, he just pulled me in. I think that was, uh, you know, he had a great imagination, but he also just, he wasn't like a refined writer that had all this technical skill, but he just could spin a yarn to the, to an average person and get them invested in it, you know? And that was kind of like part of his magic is why he was such a popular and prolific uh, writer of, of the 20th century. You know, he just knew how to tell it. Yeah. So yeah, he, I, I'm, he, not, I'm not pointing out these similarities to like take anything away from Burroughs. I just find it uh, an interesting bit of trivia. Yeah. And, 
uh, but the, I guess the, the fascinating thing about it is uh, David, or is it Robert Ludoff or David Ludoff? I can't remember. He, he does a lot of uh, series of books that study Burroughs. He kind of really delved into it. And he was of, the, of two opinions that like, it seems almost impossible he couldn't have read Gulliver of Mars. But like when you look at the print run of Gulliver of Mars, it was published in Britain. Right. Very low print run. Not many copies made it to the United States. You look at Burroughs' life. He wasn't a worldly person. He was like a, a, a just a very low income salesperson. You know, he had odd jobs. It seems almost impossible that he would have stumbled across this book. Yeah. Yeah. It's possible, but just like the probabilities would be very low. So it's just kind of interesting. Did it happen? Didn't it happen? And no one ever was able to kind of talk to him about it. So it's just one of those great mysteries. Did he ever happen to look at this and think, you know, I could do this better? Or was it, is it just like one of the great coincidences? Um, well, you know, being that you bring up that he has all of these different jobs and stuff, you know, he's sort of a, I don't want to say a failed businessman, but, you know, he, he's tried all of these different things to make a success or to have some kind of a successful business. And it just, it didn't pan out. And right. then, you know, so he has this storytelling urge inside him. And when he first submitted a princess of Mars as a manuscript, you know, they say that some of the original manuscripts and even some of the first printings of the stories, you can still see where uh, it's mis it's misattributed to Norman Bean. All right. And, that, yep. and that's because he submitted it under the name normal Bean because he thought like, well, man, they're going to think that I'm crazy submitting this story like this. So he, he didn't even put his original name to it at one point. And then it just kind of takes off, you know, it like it, you know, it, it starts, like you said, that writing style, the, the, he just really sells it. It's like, he believed in the world, he could see it and he could describe it in such a way that it really pulled in those other readers. And that's really where it started to take off. Um, I know, think the thing is with Burroughs's writing style, I hate to cut you off, but just no, no, go for it. Is that um, he's got that rare thing where he's the writer that while you're reading it, you forget you're reading a story. You're just experiencing, not all of his books, but especially with that first John Carter Mars, the first time I read it, I'm not even thinking, oh, oh, this is a good story. This is good, right? You know, because there's usually a conscious moment. You're watching a movie. Oh, this guy's a good actor. Or I think this is going to happen next in the story. Sometimes something just pulls you in. You're not even like consciously looking at it. You're just like experiencing it. And that's, yeah. for me, when I first read John Carter Mars, that's how it felt. I just felt like I was experiencing it. No. Oh. Suffice it to say, Edgar Rice Burroughs, I think, is an underrated, well, I won't say underrated writer, but he's definitely someone where uh, he's not held in the same high esteem that perhaps J.R.R. Tolkien is, who's kind of like right. seen as the great of fantasy literature. Uh, I, I would say that he was someone that at one point was probably overrated. Yeah, definitely. Um, underrated in the modern world. So probably up until about the 70s, I would say maybe overrated, maybe properly rated um but then since then his you know with, with kind of the fall of tarzan like, <laughs> time media juggernaut yeah yeah so has his star fallen oh i mean definitely i mean like listen you know he it, anything that was originally written prior to the 1920s is gonna have problematic cultural elements to it you oh, know yeah. that, that, that that's just the elephant in the room um i'd say prior to 1950 <laughs> Well, definitely. Is, but it's just that, you know, to say that there isn't like a racial component to, uh, you know, the Mars stuff is to ignore the fact oh, that like each race is kind of pitted against another race. You have the There's savage evil races. Green, and... Yeah, the savage green Tharks. You have the um, the the therns, which are like kind right. of this insidious sort of a race of white priests that are kind of holding the rest of the people in bondage. Mm -hmm. Um it's it's not as obvious and that's probably for the best because you know once you move it into the sort of uh, uh extraterrestrial races or whatever it makes it um a little less problematic because you know they're from a different planet with different social mores or whatever but uh it, it's there but yeah i mean the, john carter i mean first of all he was a confederate soldier who fought for the confederacy that's problem number one yeah uh, while on Mars, even though he treated them very well, apparently he was a yeah. slave owner there. Yeah. So I mean, there's, there's, it, it's kind of one of those things. You know, the original John Carter Mars will always be problematic, and rightfully so. Um, it was written at, at a different time, in some ways, less enlightened time. Um, you know, like other way. Uh, I, I can't really. 
Well, yeah, I mean, like, that, this, you know, this is it's thing. a little bit it's beyond like, my scope as a thinker to. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's, it's easy to get caught up in that instead of like the breakneck pace of the adventure, the imaginativeness of the worlds, the creatures, the technologies and stuff that he introduced. So, you know, I don't want to get like bogged down in, um, you know, like the social components, because there are probably people that can do a more incisive uh, view, yeah. you know, like take on that than I could. Um, right. You know, but one of the things that I always thought was funny, and I am probably misattributing this, but I want to say that, like, uh, in his book, um, man, maybe, I don't know why, but for some reason, I think that in the great comic book heroes written by Jules Pfeiffer, he briefly mentions John Carter. And one of the things that he didn't like him about John Carter was this sort of insufferable arrogance that the character had. <laughs> um, not that it was totally overt, but at one point, John Carter beats another swordsman in a sword fight, but the guy was not like evil, so he doesn't get run through or killed. Right. And when John Carter's like helping the guy up off of the ground, he says, uh, "Twere no shame for you to be defeated by me." You know, so like, <laughs> it's like it's like, yeah, you're, you're you're good, but you know, I'm a badass, so it, right. it's all right. <laughs> you know? It's no shame to lose to the best, my friend. <laughs> Right. You know, so, and the thing is, though, is like, I mean, that's not necessarily unjustified. He is the warlord of Mars, after all. Like, well, he's got superpowers, too. That's yeah. The other thing. Yeah. That's one of the other big tropes, actually. Maybe perhaps in some ways, one of the most influential tropes was that he landed on Mars. Mars has lower gravity, which gave him kind of almost the, the golden age Superman uh, suite of powers. You know, the great leaping ability, the super strength, the super speed. Yep. You know, so he had like those advantages over the other native Martians, which kind of made him. Uh, well, that's you know, important. It, that's important because that's that's part of the tropes is that like, you know, there's always the initial meeting with like the the princess character or the woman of royal blood. And then right. the, the other similar trope that always happens in these sort of planet uh, stories is that they're typically not thrown in amongst the civilized people first. They usually right. encounter one of the primitive or barbaric races of the planet and typically through some kind of like uh, show of strength or, you know, physical uh, feats of daring, uh, you know, some kind of Herculean like effort that's how they like prove themselves and therefore like john carter when he arrives um he sees one of the ships shot down this is like the ship that uh you know that deja thoris is on and then um you know when he's revealed to the martians like that that enhanced strength the leaping ability etc it's like oh well you're good enough to be a green martian even though you only have two arms <laughs> oh, so, right. well know. yeah so so it kind of serves almost two purposes, right? So number one, there's the wish fulfillment fantasy of having superpowers. Absolutely. It also provides a plausibility that he could survive in this bloodthirsty environment with all these deadly warriors. And he's got to fight a bunch of them at once without some sort of an advantage over them, you know? So it's like, you can kind of, it's still implausible, but like at the same time you're reading, you can kind of accept it. Okay, well, of course he can beat 50 guys. He's got power. You know? oh, well, I mean, they're yeah. 10 foot tall and have like four arms and each of them, right. forward, but he's super fast and can leap and is super right. strong, right. you know, and I mean, um, and, and that's key. That's important, you know, because they have to be physically preeminent in some way, you know, so I kind of wanted to go back a little bit. So there, there are two things you hit on earlier. I wanted to go back to one was the, the idea of the sword and the laser gun. Yeah. You know, one of the kind of interesting things about the sword and planet genre, it's, it's always that, um, it's almost in a post-apocalyptic genre in the sense that it's not our post-apocalypse, but it's the post-apocalypse of this other world. Yeah. They were at one technological high, but they've kind of had this descent toward barbarism. So while there is high technology, like the flying ships, uh, the little uh, light guns that they have, there's also, you know, savage weapons like spears and swords and um, the codes of honor and the, you know, kind of, conduct and the social classes are all like either medieval or earlier well, and the thing uh, is is that that was oh, built into mars as a feature of the martian world because the concept of course with mars is that mars was a dying planet the oceans had right. dried up you know there were just the yeah. canals etc but later on um that sort of like you said that built in like previously higher technological age 
and then it's kind of degraded downward into this like decayed culture with this post-apocalyptic mix of like high-tech weapons and then lower tech like swords and spears um i don't think that people always go out of their way to explain that as much in like the in the knockoffs you know or right they come, yeah. or they come up with different reasons for it uh and some of the in some of the other knockoffs later like the um like the Dre, Dre Prescott books and the Gore books by John Norman, there's usually like this kind of overclass of super beings that are deliberately keeping the populace in this kind of arrested state of development. Right, right. You know, but with, well, but with Mars, it was things. very definitely the planet was dying and the culture decayed. You know, it's one of those things like once something gets popular and people accept it, the trope is doesn't need to be explained anymore. You know, it's kind of right. like types, you know. With Batman, he's supposedly wearing that outfit to look like a giant bat. Whether he looks like a giant bat or not, I'll let others decide. But um, with with Sword and Planet, you know, like every other superhero post, him often don't have any reason to be wearing a colorful suit. It doesn't benefit them in any way. You would say right. Sword Spider Man, it'd probably benefit him to look nondescript rather than in a. Right, but you know, at that point, the 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 trope is established. You have superpowers. You put on this suit. Yeah, you know. <laughs> like sword and, sword and planet, you know, like if you're wake up on another world and you have superpowers, get ready for this basic cultural set, you know, right? Like 80% sword and sorcery, 20% ray guns, you know, mm -hmm. absolutely. So that, that was the one point you hit on earlier. And the other point I wanted to hit on is you were just about to go into it, um, where the kind of the knockoffs, you know, and, and the one thing that's interesting about sword planet and John Carter is that, well, John Carter's, you know, he's a kind of an iconic, well known name of among science fiction fans and, and science fiction. He, he's not really a well-known name, especially prior to the Disney movie, to the general public, you know? Um, no, not at all. Yeah, if I said to my grandmother, John Carter, oh, is that a friend of yours, you know? Yeah. If I said to my grandmother, Flash Gordon. Is that Jimmy Carter's brother? <laughs> yeah, oh, John Carter, he was, yes. <laughs> I remember him. <laughs> he lived down the street and he sold, uh, he sold watermelons out of the back of his truck. No, but um, Flash Gordon is the one that of that genre that became kind of that cultural yeah. icon. You know? And uh, so it, kind of going into him for a little bit, because he's, he's kind of an interesting bit too. So I originally read that, um, and I, I can't unfortunately remember the source, but uh, King Features, contemplate they wanted something to answer for, to Buck Rogers. The popular Absolutely, Rogers. yeah. So they, I heard that they had, discussed doing a John Carter comic strip, but decided that the licensing fee wasn't, you know, they didn't want to pay it. So that's how they ended up asking Alex Raymond to kind well, of- Well, that, that's because at that point in time, Raymond was probably, or not Raymond, excuse me, Alec Raymond, you know, did Flash Gordon, but Edgar Rice Burroughs was probably commanding top dollar. Oh, of course. Know? I mean, the, so, flat, the Tarzan comic strip was huge. Yeah. So you, you have, Alex, you know, it's kind of interesting to see- it's, you know, we were talking about how the one main difference you would say between Flash Gordon and John Carter Mars, and you hit on it earlier, was that John Carter found his one true love on the planet, whereas Flash Gordon brought his one true love to the planet. Right. Dale Arden. And it kind of reminds me, actually, it's like Dale Arden is Jane, Flash Gordon is Tarzan, because it's just like the Tarzan thing. Every woman on the planet is in love with Flash Gordon. Yes. And and not only in love with them, but willing to murder other yeah. people they've known their whole lives just to just to marry him. Not not even hook up with him to marry him. Yeah. Same thing happens in the Tarzan comic strips. Yeah. Every woman he meets, not just hey, I've got a crush on this guy. It's it's time to kill people to get this guy. <laughs> yeah. You know. So yeah. it, it, so it just kind of struck me that they're kind of like almost in a way. Yeah. Combination of his two most successful creations but um so, so flash gordon you know why did that take off more so than the the john carter strip that's kind of an interesting question well well definitely i mean like there were john carter comics you know gold key put some out and you know i'm sure there were other publishers and i i just have to be perfectly honest that like part of it is the artistic mastery of alex raymond that yeah. art is just gorgeous. Quite honestly, as, as much as I love John Carter, most of those John Carter comics are pretty boring to look at. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I don't think he really gets a comic book artist that can really handle yeah. it until probably Gil Kane. 
Yeah. In the 90s. And even then, I, I love Gil Kane. I think he's a master, but like Alex Raymond's in that top stratosphere of just like the guys that just changed the game. I would say this though, actually, because I really, you know, as much as I love comics, I think that the multimedia element is important. And I think I would actually say that the number one prohibitive thing about John Carter was there was no way to realistically do the, the 14 foot tall yeah. armed green Martians. Whereas everyone in the flash Gordon strip is basically. Yeah. Being. Yeah. Yeah. So that, like, when you want to do your film serials and you want to produce them on the cheap, which all film serials were produced on. It's a no brainer. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that that's part of it is like the ability to adapt it into other media to get it in front of the eyes of the audience, you know, and I mean, like kids, Saturday morning cereal, you know, like movies, that that was the way to do it. And yeah, it, John Carter had so many fantastic, I, I mean, it, it, not to not to belabor this comparison that we keep coming back to, but it's just like how up until a certain point, you only had the animated Rankin Bass films for J.R.R. Tolkien. It's like the ideas are so big, there's so many creatures and so much uh, intense imagery that it's just hard to to film it with actual live action, you know, principles. I mean, right. it, it literally took until Peter Jackson, who had a history of being able to mix like miniatures and live action and special effects together to get that. And, you know, it just wasn't possible at the time. And, yeah. you know, so like it kind of kept it confined to the realm of literature and to a lesser degree comics. I mean, Dave Cockrum and Gil Kane, they're both great. And I enjoy those uh, John Carter comics from Mars or from Mars, from Marvel. But um, yeah, yeah, it, it, it's a shame because, you know, he lent so much to so many other high profile franchises and so many other concepts. And yet somehow it's forgotten. So I think that like we're part of that niche audience, you know, right. people where it's like you want to go back to the roots. You want to read like the the stuff that inspired the things that you love. And, you know, to a degree, that's always going to keep John Carter kind of bottled up in a certain area. Now, it's obvious yeah. how many other people loved him by how many other people have tried to use that same formula to one degree or another. And All right. You know, and, and there's there's other stuff. I mean, it's not just Sword and Planet. Like, I would almost go, I would almost say um, something you might not be familiar with, but it, it's funny because it goes back to that post-apocalyptic scenario that we were talking about. Um, the Horse Clans novels by Robert Adams deal with a post-apocalyptic America where there's been like a limited exchange nuclear war, things have broken down, stuff is kind of like pseudo-feudal polities, and um, in it, the main character, Milo Murray, doesn't remember where he came from. He is an immortal and he's good with a sword and he's good with a gun, you know, and he's kind of destined to become this kind of warlord figure that kind of unites all these different like inner scene like conflicts amongst post-apocalyptic America. But the character himself has that that same John Carter quality of being the eternal soldier that doesn't really remember where he got started. And right. while, while it's not sword and planet, I feel like um, it's a shame because Robert Adams has passed away. So there, there's not really any way to get his take on it, but I, I would, uh, you know, I would bet dimes to dollars that John Carter was an influence on that character. You know, it seems like of that generation, it's almost impossible for Burroughs to not be an influence in some way, you know, um, yeah. Moorcock, Alan Moore. I mean, just, you know, when you start getting into writers of that gen generation and that era of like every generation basically that preceded him or pro uh, pre not preceded, what's the other, the, the reverse, <laughs> follow yeah. him. Yeah, the antecedent um, like th that came after, right? Yeah, I mean, like several decades because he was, his books were well in print up into the 70s, right? The 80s, very accessible, very available to find. So uh, he, you know, he was definitely someone that, you know, even if you were, weren't trying to be influenced by him, it, he would almost be that kind of thing where you, would, I don't like this guy, so I'm going to do something different than what right. he likes kind of a thing. You know, he's just so, he's in the waters, basically. There's no way to avoid him. Right. So like, even if you're trying to Gross. run counter to the counter to the current, you're still being influenced by it because you're trying to do the opposite of what he did. Yeah. Right, right. So, you know, so it's interesting. So Flash Gordon is out there as a series uh, and he kind of fills that void that, you know, they couldn't, they either couldn't or wouldn't bring John Carter to 
a mass media thing. And that's like, you know, it wasn't just that uh, Flash Gordon was successful as a comic strip. He was also successful. Like people remember probably Buster Crab just as much as Alex Raymond's art. Yeah. Um, and he was on television, you know, there were animated series. So he was, he was kind of a, a, you know, he was obviously one of the key influences on Star Wars, but he was kind of the Star Wars of that generation or several generations, probably up through, I don't know, early sixties, something like yeah, that. Definitely. Definitely. Well, you know, speaking of animation, of course, you know, there is the like very, very limited amount of footage of like the, the Fleischer attempt at getting <laughs> a John Carter series off the ground. And it's really nothing more than like a little bit of uh, some warriors like riding on the, yeah. what are like the six or eight legged horses where they called thoats. And, yeah. and, but, but the thing is, is when you look at how gorgeous the animation is of the Fleischer Superman stuff, and you imagine what could have been, I know uh, it kills, it kills you, man. It just, of course. For the other thing, the other one too, is the, uh, the I, you know, I, I've read that uh, Harryhausen, was looking at either in the late 60s or early 70s uh, he would have like 50 projects or something like that in the pipes like all right what can i do yeah that was that was like one of them and just kind of imagine man those claymation imagine like the the, uh, four, the harryhausen yeah, yeah could have done john carter sword fighting him you know it would have been even better than cgi you know because well, you know and, and, and harryhausen definitely had that affinity for creatures with multiple arms you know, right. like you have the Kraken, which had four arms, um, and like uh, the Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, you have the Snake Woman that has multiple arms. So, ah, uh, uh, yeah, that that's another one of those kind of like missed opportunities in some other dimension. You know, there those movies got made, right? You know, someone's enjoying them out there in, in the multiverse, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, not us though, unfortunately. No, no. I mean, but that, but that's fine because a lot of times, I mean, I hate to say it, you know, no offense to anybody that was a kid and grew up with them or whatever, but it's like it's the, it's the difference between me imagining what the Star Wars prequels would have been like and then what they right. were, you know. That's so it, it's just a matter of like imagining what those you know john carter of mars projects would have been like versus probably what they would have been but right, you would have imagined them being more like the first sinbad movie and less like the last sinbad movie right right but but here's the thing it's like if you grow up watching them in endless reruns on tbs during the summer it's not going to matter either way they're going to be like part of your kind of nostalgic foundational films you know right I mean, right so you know caroline monroe is deja thoris of course of course why not um, so kind of look, going back to the tropes aspect of it, you know, so if I can imagine someone being a stickler and saying, well, hold on a second, Flash Gordon is, is space opera. It's not sword and planet because uh, one of the key tropes that's often used again and again is that kind of magic portal yeah. to the other. Like with John Carter, it's like some sort of an astral projection. He, he's about to die. And everyone who, who goes to Mars, they're about, they're in a death situation. They close their eyes. They wake right. up. Mars. and virtually like you know uh, lynn carter's beyond the green star there's always some sort of it's not really crystal clear how they get to the planet you know is it is it almost is it like a flight of fancy is it like they've been knocked yeah. out imagining it is it the afterlife there's always kind of that mysterious aspect with, with flash gordon it was concrete they got into a rocket and they flew to this uh world that you know could fly around the universe and not be affected by it and, and that does lend towards saying it's space opera, but for my own personal look at like what the criteria of how we decide if something is sword and planet, I don't feel like the vehicle, I, I agree. you know, is, is important, whether it's astral projection, whether it's some kind of magical portal, whether it's a rocket ship, you know, I think that sword and planet is defined by a lot of other criteria, you know, it's well, I, number one, I, I totally agree with you. Um, and we saw actually John, uh, Burroughs use that with the Venus series, like the yeah. guy used the rocket ship to get to Venus. But the reason I bring it up, I, I kind of wanted to use that as my uh, segue. Right. Segue is that trope. Like, what is it with the trope? You know, like Burroughs could have got him to Mars in any number of ways. And like, that's a trope that's often copied. You know, there are certain other things that happen in those books that people didn't copy. But yeah. one of the key things that seems to be a huge, you know, appeal of the genre is the idea of like, the magical, metaphysical, almost right. new age spiritual journey to the other world. Because because so, when John Carter gets hurled back, he wakes back up in the cave, right? And the guy that was with him is like a skeleton by then. So his body, in theory, 
his body has lain in some kind of state of like suspended animation while his soul traveled to Mars and then like took on like some kind of physical form on Mars, you know? Right. Uh, that just happens so often, you know, um, let's, let's kind of look here. I'm, I got like a list, you know, uh, Drake Prescott in transit Scorpio. He's a British sailor. He's thrown overboard. And uh, I guess he's, teleported to Cregan. Yes. Uh, like in the original novel, it's more like he just got thrown overboard and, and woke up on a leaf or something like that. Right. Um, then you have, let's see, um, Mac uh, from Sword of Rhiannon from the mm -hmm. group, uh, late bracket, I believe. Yep. yep. She, you know, he can, he's given the magic sword and he, he ends up on ancient Mars. Mm -hmm. um, Tarl Calbit, you know, he gets transported to Gore. We find out later it's through kind of more sci-fi-ish means, but yeah, but the, but initially in the first book, it does have a very mystical component because he has some ring that his father gave him, and he goes on a camping trip and he's looking up at the stars, and it, yeah, so there there's there's very much a similarity to that whole kind of mystical yeah. projection into space. Probably one of the coolest takes on it I felt was in the World of Tears series. Mm -hmm. I um. Uh, Philip Jose Farmer. Philip Jose Farmer, the horn. I thought that was such yeah. a brilliant way to do it, and it really just captures the kind of magical quality of that teleportation. Even though that's kind of a little more of a straight sci-fi series, there's not a lot of metaphysical stuff to it. Which yeah, kind of the curtain. But it's such a cool idea. One uh, of the one, one of the ones where it goes more instead of more in a sci-fi <laughs> direction, but it moves more in a fantasy direction. Um, but initially that first book is very sword and planet, even though it moves very firmly into fantasy after that is um, the, the witch world stuff. Uh, and how am I blanking on it? Uh, Andre Norton, uh, which okay. world? and what it is, is uh, Simon Tregarth is kind of like a secret agent on earth. So he's already good at shooting and he's already good at <laughs> fighting, you know, and uh, he's on the run and he's trying to like escape his old life. And he meets this guy that tells him that, and it's a scientist, like this kind of wacky crackpot scientist guy. And uh, he's discovered the Siege Perilous, which is the mystical rock throne that Merlin used. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you sit yourself on the throne, it sends you to like the world that you're best suited to. And so Simon Tregarth like sits on the siege perilous and gets sent to the witch world. And in that initial um, story in that first book, it's very much a uh, fantasy oriented, but the, the primary antagonists are more technically oriented. So there is that right. mixture of kind of like a barbaric world with some high tech stuff going on. But uh, it, it, it pretty firmly moves into fantasy almost immediately in the books after and never like really revisits that technical component. So that first one is Sword and Planet, but that's that's what's funny is the first one is Sword and Planet, but the subsequent books are not, you know. Right. And I think that, um, you know, it, it's interesting because that's the question is like, sword and planet has to be more than just going over to the other world and whether or not you have like a gun and a sword, you know, there's that degraded civilization. There's the, um, <clears throat> there's the princess component, which is common to fantasy science fiction right. and sword and planet. Uh, sometimes. And it's funny though, because like, it seems like there is like some interchange there's like going to the other planet and then almost invariably at some point they're kicked out and they're sent back. And then, yeah. like, they kind of, they struggle to return or they want to return right. very badly. And it's uh, maybe not quite Arthurian, but it's sort of like they can't go back until they're needed again, you know, or, yeah. they, or they find some other way to return. because Well, it always seems like, and I can't, you know, I haven't read as much as you, but with the first John Carter, it seemed like that ending was written so that if that was the final book, he just one and done, he wrote the right. one. That would be kind of that poignant ending. He would look up at the at Mars and wonder, did they make it? Did I yep. say, hey, will I ever go back? I'll never know. So it's kind of like that, like the end of the first Tarzan where he's like. Yeah, it's tragic, but it's beautiful. You know, right. Like, yeah, it's almost like you kind of, it's kind of like the end of the first Rocky movie. You almost wish that the sequels didn't happen because it's such a beautiful ending. Um, but once he gets back to the planet, no problem. Yeah. He can hang out there. It doesn't matter if they need him or not. And see, yeah. like, that's the trope, you know. He gets kicked out for a little bit, but all right, come on back. We missed right. you, son of a gun. 
Well, and that's funny because it's sort of like, especially with the Mars one, because, you know, we're, we're kind of, we're, you know, we're, we're going a little further afield to like these other things, but like that, that being the key one, that being the one that kind of sets the template for the rest of the genre. It's like Mars is heaven for a soldier. <clears throat> it's like, it's a planet of ceaseless strife and war where everything is clear cut, you know, like the good guys are really good and the bad guys are really fucking awful. So there's, there's right. never, there's never any doubt about who you need to shoot or who you need to run through. And you know. women, you know, as long as you're pure of heart and good with a sword. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Right. And I, you know, and I think that that's, that's the beauty of it. I mean, it is very clear cut adventure. It's very, you know, uh, Manichaean is kind of like an archaic term to use, but it's very clearly cut black and white. Good is good. Evil is evil. And even later stuff, even the sword, you know, even the space opera that is descended from sword and planet, like star Wars has that, like the good guys are really good and the bad guys are really bad. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, I think that's part of the appeal of some of the older stuff is like the simplicity of it. Sure. Sure. There's anything wrong with obviously complexity or anything like that, but sometimes you just want, junk food you know you just want it to be easy yeah uh, and you want the cheap thrills and that, i think that's what a lot of that uh sword and planet stuff really gives you um so let's uh I, i'm gonna put an aside and you're gonna get it out but Go like for it. Got nine minutes left so i don't know how you want to handle this but i was thinking let's talk about like uh other examples you know your favorites of the genre that kind of sure. stuff I'm like okay oh uh, well, it's well not my time favorite... to talk about it though with eight minutes left well it's all good i mean we can restart another one here in a minute okay. I, I hate that this thing limits it like that but the whole goal of course is for them to sell their fucking product or whatever right, it's like right, right. i'm not buying your shit i'm just using the free one right. um, i mean i love flash gordon obviously flash gordon was the big one for me like even reading uh john carter of mars first you know, the first Flash Gordon book that I read was um, The Underwater World of Mongo. It was a black and white compilation that I found in a military library in like a Navy base in Maryland. And uh, it was like this gore because there it was not a color reprint. So it's this gorgeous black and white art yeah. by Alex Raymond. And those are desirable, too. I think I think a lot of collectors want those. Oh, my God, man. I, I loved it so much. I mean, like, obviously, uh, well, you know. Not for nothing. I'm sure the statute of limitations has expired, but that never went back to the library. You know, <laughs> like, that, that thing's staying home. You're the with one. Me. Yeah, you know, that thing's staying home with me. Yeah, I, and, I found like one of those Fireside Hulk books at a base library once. I thought about stealing it, but, you know, you know, it, the but, Superman coat of honor, I returned it. And of course, I never got it again because the next person who took it out was right. Like, oh, right. But, but the thing is, is that like, <sighs> It's so like, again, it's very similar to my experience with the John Carter on Mars because it was not the first Black, uh, Flash Gordon book. So like the adventure is already in place. And I think that part of the virtue of the genre and the stuff that's done really well is you don't really need the first one. You can just be dropped into it and you kind of, right. like, you get it like almost immediately. And, you know, I don't know, man, like Flash Gordon had a lot of like interesting technical stuff. Like it definitely had a, um, a science fictional component of either Dr. Zarkov was always cobbling together weird devices or you were being exposed to some like previously unknown aspect of like the Mongo like technology. And there were always like these great weird creatures, like especially th there were a few of them in the uh, in the underwater world of Mongo edition. But some of those creatures, again, it goes back to this, you just can't do it in live action. I mean, like some of these monsters right. and some of these creatures were just like really beyond what was available to like the movie makers at the time. Yeah, and, I would say also that the, the John Carter, not John Carter, the Flash Gordon comic strips really enjoyed some of the best artists of all. You had Alex Graham, but even after Alex Graham was done with the strip, you had Austin Briggs, then you had Mac Raboy. yeah. It's like yeah. a murderer's row of just like basically to get that job, you had to be like the creme de la creme of the industry. So it had that going for you know it's interesting because John Carter is primarily known through the books, right? Yep. That's all that was available. But there have been a few novelizations of Flash Gordon, but it's basically either comics or it's movie screens. And you could make the argument the reason Flash Gordon got big is you know it's one thing to read about sword fights, it's one thing to talk about or read about beautiful women, but to actually see the beautiful women actually. Mm -hmm. see and actually see the monsters yeah to another level and not to to put down burroughs writing i know 
tremendous. Uh, but I think for a general audience, just seeing that stuff, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words, as they say. Yeah, you know, and and don't get me wrong. I mean, like, even as a kid, I kind of thought that Flash Gordon was sort of a meathead. I mean, quite honestly, <laughs> quite honestly. I mean, like, well, I mean, like, when, when it goes to, like, like you said, there's that wish fulfillment component of having the superpowers and being super strong and beating the other, you know, evil monsters and creatures in a fight. Um, you know, like, I mean, I remember watching Flash Gordon, the movie, with, like, Ornella Muti as a... Uh, you know, Princess Aura, and it's like, what, you know, Princess Aura is going to throw herself at you, but like, no, Dale, that that's what I want, Dale. Yeah. It's like, okay. I mean, no, no offense to the actress who played Dale, because she's a very beautiful, like, woman, but Ornella Muti had this, you know, exotic, you know, look, and this, like, skin tight oh, uh, I mean, I think stuff. it's the slam, no one's going to disagree with what you're saying, I think, even in the cartoon filmation version, you know? Yeah. The, the aura was drawn much more attractively than yeah Dale. she had this like crazy big like 80s hair and this like oh, skin yeah, tight yeah. little midriff bearing kind and of thing. I, it's kind of she had a physique that you're surprised they, they could get away with giving a woman a physique for a children's cartoon well, absolutely because one of the most vivid images that i have from that filmation cartoon is her like kind of in south reclining like on this like pile of furs or whatever and it's like wow i'm 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 pretty young and I'm kind of having some strange feelings. <laughs> yeah, about this you know, cartoon. it's kind of like Tila and the Masters of the Universe. You know, they, they the filmation women were drawn, um, I guess, by uh, lonely men. Let's just say. <laughs> um you're, you're probably not wrong but you know it, it is what it is but i mean so th that's one of the key things is that visual component is a big draw for flash gordon and that's why that's one of my favorites of the genre um what flash gordon lacks that john carter has that he doesn't is the powers you know like flash right. you know how many times has flash been hitting over the back of the head and like knocked out you know like right. that, that guy has severe brain damage from multiple <laughs> concussions you know well, you know he I actually, you just remind me, I did want to say something. So you have like, John, you know, Flash Gordon's the media, but so is John Carter to a certain extent. And when you kind of read through them, they're generally speaking, these guys. And, you know, there's a kind of like, uh, people have talked about how all the DC superheroes have that same personality before Marvel and stuff like that. And I kind of wonder, you know, some, some, I think a lot of people attribute to being like maybe unsophisticated from a writing perspective, but I've come to wonder if that's so that that reader identification and projection fantasy is easier with these kind of like nondescript generic good guys. Cause yeah, like look at what John Carter does, even if you're not a particularly brave or heroic person in your everyday life, but you read what John Carter does. Well, of course I would jump in there against 50 guys right. <laughs> that are 14 feet tall with four. Yeah. Arms. Of course I would do that to save the girl. You know, you, I wouldn't sure. Yeah, so it's easy to like kind of yeah. identify characters because they have no real distinct personality traits to object to. Well, you know, well, and you're not wrong about that, but there's also that component of like, listen, you know, Flash Gordon and John Carter are just obviously of higher moral fiber than I was. Like, well, you, know I mean? you know, well, it's like, <laughs> I, I mean, like, it's, it's funny because like I'm older now and like, you know, obviously, you know, I got kids, so I got skin in the game and it's like, you know, you want to make the right choice and do the right thing. But like, you know, as like an immoral young teenager, like reading this stuff is like, you're goddamn right. I'd be warlord of Mars. Right. Right. <laughs> I mean, well, you, you can really get to have it both ways. So, you, so, you know, there it's got, you know, the virtuous aspect, of course I'd be a hero, but it's also got the, I'm kicking everyone's ass. Yeah. The, the head cheerleader wants me. Right. I'm the alpha male, you know, it's got that nerd kind of like. Yeah. So I don't, I don't have to be bad and I don't have to be evil because I'm getting everything that I wanted anyway. Right. Exactly. Like why be evil if you're Superman, you know, you, you, you got it all. There's well, no you know, Marcus, Marcus Aurelius, you know, stoic philosopher said that all cruelty stems from weakness. Nietzsche had a similar philosophy that like the Ubermensch doesn't have to be evil because like he can afford to be good because he's perfect. Right. You know, he's and, so satisfied, yeah. right? You know, and then you've got that with like John Carter. You got that with Flash. It's like, of course, of course, I can be content with Dale. I could have all these other women throwing themselves at my feet if I wanted them. But no, right. I want this frousy reporter chick from Earth. All right, <laughs> you know? I'll let I'll let Zarkov handle all these broads. <laughs> right. uh, that's fine, Flash. I I will handle that. That would party. actually be a cool idea for like a, a humor stripper, like Zarkov's side adventures on one. <laughs> Okay, so one of the things that I was going through here in the little hiatus was I was like rereading some of the stuff. You've got a lot of really good stuff here where you kind of lay out some of the requirements of the genre, some of the similarities. It doesn't matter like what the franchise is. And 
you know, you have here that the love interest is often brave and loyal, but will act snotty, hard to get or disinterested. That that's, that's a key element or there's, that or as is often common with a lot of Burroughs stuff, not just the Mars thing, but there's always some kind of fundamental misunderstanding. You know, it's always right, you know, like oh we discussed what? earlier. Remember, I said the thing about the earlobes, you didn't grab your earlobes twice before you talked to me. So now right, right. Or but whatever it is, like you know, initially, um, aside from the fact that John Carter looks strange, he's not a red Martian, it's obvious that he's been accepted into the uh, Thark horde. Right. You know, so like he he is like of the Tharks and those are considered barbarians who hate and relentlessly make war against the Red Martians. But then like one of the other things that you have here, which I think is key to the entire genre, is that the allies. Right. And you have here that the ally will usually include a brave, selfless friend who admires the hero's physical abilities, fighting prowess, strength of the protagonist, etc. The friend is usually either a soldier or a member of royalty. Mm -hmm. um, and that also the allies can include a loyal beast or pet and a traitor who pretends to be an ally but wants the love interest for himself. And all of that is rock solid. Like every one of those, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that that is like almost invariably consistent throughout like the entire genre. But um, the only thing that I would add with the allies is, of course, that <clears throat> there is a savage ally and then a civilized ally. Oh, that's true. You know, there's always like Ars a carcass. Yeah. Yeah, there's always a representative of the savage race and then a representative of the civilized race. And both of those, for whatever reason, you know, find themselves attached to the hero. Um, and then, of course, the pet, which is interesting that you bring up. I, that is a little less common, but is one of my favorite components of the genre, or at least right, of John Carter. Speed. Yeah, well, you know, John Carter has it with uh, Wula, you know, mm -hmm. the, the Martian dog, the Callet. And then... Um, Lynn Carter, uh, you know, archetypal fanboy made good, you know, like almost everything right. that he does is like a pastiche of something that he loved. He's, and he, he's the Roy Thomas of fantasy writing. Ab absolutely he is. And that's OK. Like, I don't begrudge him that. Like, hey, man, they're living you know, the life, right? Well, you know, because part of it is also like once you've read through all the material and you don't have anything else by the originals to read, the you know, the Lynn Carter stuff will do in a pinch, you know? <laughs> yeah. And it's like, but but he has a similar thing with the John Dark series where there's a, a similar kind of creature, uh, like a frog-like kind of multi-limbed dog creature in the Callisto books. And part of that is, for whatever reason, I love cats. Um, my wife says I have like a cat-like component to me where it's like, I want to, I want attention and affection when I want attention and affection. So like, right. I've got like a cat-like personality, but I love dogs. And so part of that is like, I love it whenever there's some kind of like weird mutated animal or something, you right. know, that that's dog like. I love Wula. I love um like I'll watch a movie and be like, oh, I want that thing. Like when well, I remember being a kid and when like Search for Spock came out and like the evil Christopher Lloyd, like Klingon, is sitting there in his ship and he's got that ugly ass, like weird mutated looking dog. Mm -hmm. I was like, I want that thing. <laughs> yeah, there should be like a, a the ultimate creature i'd just be like a like a dog the size of a bear so you could ride the dog so it could be your horse and your dog all in one so kind of like chewbacca except like not bipedal or like a chewbacca <laughs> yeah you know like i mean you know because th there's just something about that and that goes back to the wish fulfillment it goes back to like being a young boy and being kind of in love with the genre that like there's this sort of you're not just a superhero with these superpowers you've got a super pet you know <laughs> yeah and I mean, and it's crypto. Yeah, right. And literally, like later on, like the whole Superman thing followed that entire mold. You know, like you said, crypto. You know, this. All right. Uh, you know. So, so back to the tropes, though. I would another one is that you know it seems that a common thread is that the the character will often find himself up against and eventually disproving many of the planet's deeply held religious or cultural beliefs. Yes. Yes. You know, like. Um, well, that's a common theme through a lot of Burroughs' work of just many religious figures seem to be charlatans or yep. um, some sort of a scam. Yeah, like it ca the casting down of the false idol or otherwise, right. like, you know, the kind of the instant, the institutionalized religion in some form or another is either corrupt or debased 
or uh, predicated upon some kind of like falsehood or exploitation. And that's an interesting component of Burroughs' stuff overall, which I feel like really that really deserves like a deeper look from someone that really wants to like, I mean, I could even see myself doing it if I had the spare time, but that look into what was Burroughs' spirituality, because, and I've mentioned this to you, I don't feel like it's coincidence that John Carter of Mars, John Clayton, you know, Lord Greystoke, Tarzan and Jesus Christ all have the same, you know, initials i i just don't think that that's coincidence and johnny cash and johnny cash you know the man in black so you know arguably the most awesome of all those archetypes <laughs> <laughs> but like but you know there's something to that because you know you have in the second book gods of mars um sure. you know in fact here we go i went ahead and pulled them out might as well you know throw out the prop there but you know gods of mars and Lord of mars Great science fiction book club edition with the gorgeous, you know, wraparound cover by Frank Frazetta. I mean, John as far as Carter. I'm concerned, uh, Burroughs' is best artist and Howard's best artist. Yeah, I mean, he, you know, John Carter never looked better than that. And I love those Michael Whalen covers. Don't he's, get me he's wrong. He's a great artist. But they're... Michael Whalen, for me, I like to see him on uh, Elric. Yes, definitely. Because he's perfect for Elric. But for Pulp, I want Frazetta. And, you know, the, the, and that's because there's like, there's this there's this violence and this kinetic like addiction to motion in the Frazetta stuff that matches yeah. that kind of breakneck nature of, you know, Burroughs' writing. And well, well, uh, yeah, Frazetta drew bodies in motion, whereas most painters tend to, even when it's an action scene, they draw the, they're using reference and they're drawing the body at rest, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, but you've got Gods of Mars where, you know, uh, the, the you know the desolated Deja Thoris who thinks that she's never going to see her husband again has decided right. to go down the river Is and travel to like you know the Martian underworld and uh, you know Is of course named after the goddess Is who's like this kind of evil Baba Yaga kind of like hag you know who's you know like if it, if it were a modern movie or a modern story she would be gorgeous she would be beautiful <laughs> she would be like as seductive and svelte and like she as hella uh, yeah as hella as like as evil could be you know right. but you know in in edgar rice Burroughs's view of the world like evil is of course ultimately ugly you know right so the, you, know, you have bad this, guys like, always twirl their mustache in the grip. yeah you know so you have like this evil goddess who's like tricked an entire planet of people that when it's time to die because the martians are functionally if not immortal, then incredibly long lived. But when yeah. they when they grow tired of living or they're broken hearted like Dejah Thoris is, you go down this river and it carries you into the underground cavern or whatever, and they they scoop you up and then they eat you. Right. <laughs> I mean, they, they suck your blood out and they serve you up literally as food. You know, the worshipers are the food of the gods. Yeah. And, you know, there, there's similar things in a couple of the later... Uh, you know mars novels by burroughs there's some similar like uh i can't remember if it was if it was john carter or if it was the later one with uh ulysses paxton is that it the fighting man of mars yeah he's the he's ulysses yep. so but it, it was either john carter or ulysses paxton but there was a later book where he also encounters like this weird idol and he's with his friend he's with that ally who likes him but the ally feels the need to abase himself and do all of these weird rituals in front of this idol. And Ulysses Paxton is like, I'm not doing that. <laughs> you know? right. And, you know, it's like, so th there's definitely uh, a similarity to some of the. Well, and then later they, there's like, like a, there's a wizard of Oz situation where. Yes. Yeah. An idol with like cranks and lovers. Right. Exactly. And that goes back to, um, you know, in some of the Tarzan novels, there's similar stuff like Tarzan and the leopard men, like where the leopard God, like, oh, there's the, the, le the voice of the leopard God. And of course it's some dude like hiding inside the idol, you know, there's, there's fakery involved, but, um, bringing up Ulysses Paxton brings up also uh, another aspect of Sword and Planet, which is that sometimes uh, not as common, but definitely it happened in, I know it happened in the Gore novels. Uh, I can't recall if it happened in the Cregan novels with Dre Prescott, but 
after a certain point, it's almost like the writer gets maybe not bored or wants to kind of revisit the newness of the world. So they bring another person in. You right. know, it's like, you know, it, it's not just that there's the one Earth man or whatever. It's not just John Carter, Ulysses Paxton, another soldier gets introduced to the same world. Um, you know, it happens with uh, Tarl Cabot and Gore. And I can't remember the name of the later guy, but, you know, he gets brought in during like, you know, fighting slave Agore or whatever the hell it's called. I don't know. So, but, um, you know, you, we're kind of talking about some of, you know, earlier we mentioned some of the spinoffs, you know, there's Beyond the Farthest Star, there's, you know, one of the Lynn Carter books, Transit to Scorpio, all that stuff. But you bring up Gore, which you could kind of argue is like one of the only 70 spinoffs that had something and a little interesting about it. Because most yeah. of them you just read them, they're enjoyable, but they're just pot boilers you know, for Edgar Rice Burroughs fans, John Carter fans, Gore is a little bit more controversial. It's a little, it's, it's got a lot of those same tropes, but it introduces some tropes from a, a genre you wouldn't expect, which is the BDSM. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's like, um, you know, way long ago in the, in the early days of the internet or whatever, back when I had a live journal, I wrote what I considered a fairly comprehensive review of the Gore books. And here's the thing, like, at a certain phase of my development when I was a young man, I mean, obviously, you know, gore is kind of, it's spank material, you know what I mean? It, <laughs> it, it is, it's, it's spank material, you know, that's, it's, that's um, so sad. <laughs> I, I'm just saying it's kinky. It's like, definitely it, it's transgressive, you know, cause you have to remember that when this stuff was written, it was running completely counter to like the feminist movement, women's rights, you know, the whole oh, yeah. enlightened concept of like how like men and women are supposed to relate to one another. And Gore is saying like, no, we're all animals. It's all dominance and submission. And, and the thing is, is like John Norman, God bless him. You know, he's, it's all based around his particular kinks and fetishes. It doesn't really, it does. It's it's not a balanced look at how men and women actually like interrelate. And I'm not even talking about just men and women. If you just look at like primates, if you look at nature, <laughs> you know, it, you don't he, say. Well, I mean, but but the thing is, is that because of that added element, it's had more longevity than some of the other spinoffs have. Yeah, you know, it's funny because I, I actually read the first. I don't know, I want to say like four. Yeah, and, you know, I, I actually didn't find. Because they all have like something kind of, you know, because again, with John Carter, like he owns slaves, he, there's certainly something a little bit messed up going on in the background. Yeah, yeah. I didn't find that component of it to be overbearing or take me out. Of, like to me, like the first three, especially, were just like classic swashbuckling sword and sorcery with that science fiction element well the, the third one is great because the third one is sort of almost his version of gods of mars because right. it's, it's priest kings of gore and you find out about the inner workings of what's going on behind right. the scenes where it's these weird aliens are kind of like controlling and stunting like human development on the planet they control the level of technological development it was it was more science fictional than anything because there's this there's this entire war underground, like a civil war between the two different branches of the insectoid race. And right. but here's the thing: John, it's just John, interesting John, that he eventually made that transition. It's like you know, I got this little sword and planet series going. I'm Fox, but you know, what can I do? What's different? You know, what can I do different with the series? And that's well, you know, it. Was, it was always there. But I think that he just realized what side his bread was buttered on. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, was, it was just a matter of like, this is, I mean, and I don't know if it was his editors saying it to him or if it was just his particular kinks that were like, no, this is what's got to be put forward. But it's like, hey, this is what is selling the books. So you've got to like put more of this like front and center. And maybe a little of both. Like, hey, the, the oh, first, maybe. The first four books, I feel like, are really solid. Like, even setting aside all of John Norman's wacky theories about evolution and sexual politics or whatever, those first four books are, like, really solid, like, sword and planet books. And then after that, it kind of, like, it gets erratic. You know what I mean? Like, uh, the, the thing is, is that John Norman had a very interesting through line to his stories, but it's sort of like it got to a point where it was like, uh, let me skip however many 10, 12 pages of like convincing some chick that she needs to be a slave and just get to like the four or five pages where like the plot actually moves forward. Right, right. And, it, you know, after a point, it's like, I mean, 
the cover. I mean, a lot of great Boris covers. Um, yeah, those, later, those first like some, six Boris covers are awesome. Yeah, and then you know later there's like some good. I want to say there's some good Ken Kelly covers and stuff like yeah. that. But um, you know, it just got to a point where it's like, uh, you know, I'm a book hound anyway. And I'm a pack right. rat anyway. So it's like, you, you know, you get into this habit of just like, uh, I grab it, I buy it, I'll read it one day. And it's like, no, I won't, you know, <laughs> but it, it's just nice to look at it. And it's like, that's the thing is that a lot of times with some of the, with some of the branches of the sword and planet genre, is the story going to really be better than what you imagine the story is based upon the cover? Who knows? You know? Right. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing about those fantasy covers is, you know they they're really evocative when they're done by the good artists you know yeah yeah John Norman, it's one of those things you know there's a part of you that kind of feels like gosh you know if he didn't bring in all this weird bdsm stuff you know maybe it could have really gone somewhere but then you think if he didn't would it even be around maybe it would have only lasted six or seven volumes well that's hard to say because when you look at the other big um series that i feel like was inspired by john carter of mars you're looking at Craigan, and the Craigan right. series has way more longevity than john carter or mars there's literally dozens and dozens yeah of i books. think there's like 60 something volumes or something yeah like, yeah several were published in german yeah and, and and it's incredible how many of them that there are uh you know whether or not like the writing quality is better than burroughs that's debatable but um it's the only other really series that's had an extended lifespan you know to where like it's vi it's like it's a viable franchise you know yeah, i mean you think about these things as kind of ongoing serials and not just like finite stories it's kind of like 64 uh, that would probably be content wise the equivalent of like i don't know, like a 300 issue run of something you know right yeah and you know and these are mostly of course these are mostly like slim paperbacks you know uh john norman kind of got like a little more verbose as he went along and yeah, he wasn't quite at that whole doorstop phase of like where fantasy novels have like right, gotten. Right. But you know, that's the thing. Like when you get to page count or whatever, like the Craigan series would probably be like maybe I don't know equivalent to one of these like what like Robert Jordan where he's got like ten or twelve volumes of a fantasy series and like they're all these big honking like right. fat you know novels or whatever, but. I liked the Craigan series. I thought it was fun. I feel like there were actually some similarities to what was going on in the Gore stuff because the real intrigue of the Gore series to me was that the human race was chosen almost as like a, a proxy war. You know, like Earth and Counter Earth were essentially like Vietnam in a war between two other alien races. And one of the alien right. races is insectoid, and one of the alien races is kind of like the if the predators were mammals, I guess, you know. Right. And it was interesting because the idea was was that the insectoid race ultimately understood that it couldn't understand its enemy. So it picked the humans. We're like, you guys are more like these people that are trying to kill us. So we're going to train you guys to be our army. And, right. you know, and, and that was like an interesting premise to me because like eventually the human race, uh, almost in a moralistic or biblical framework, the human race had to pick like, which side do you really have loyalty towards? The insectoid creatures or the creatures that are mammalian and more like you? And that to me was a very interesting like fundamental premise but like you said you know, michael, I, I read that michael moorcock did something similar with like his eternal champ one of his eternal champion books yeah yeah the, the first eternal champion series with john dacre um i think like the first one was phoenix and obsidian and right. or maybe it was the ice schooner i can't remember which one but yeah it was like eventually the the eternal champion has to choose between the human race and this more like elven race like which one are you going to be loyal towards and that to me is a very interesting premise but the problem is is that you know norman gets bogged down in like all of the weird like mm -hmm. you know sexual hullabaloo which you know right the foot fetish race of course is right the... yeah <laughs> right right i mean it, it's kind of like how you can watch a quentin tarantino film and man it's really great but why in the hell are there so many like foot shots in this thing <laughs> <laughs> you know? so so, you know, you kind of bring up these big honk and Robert Jordan books, you know, the fantasy genre seem there's no shortage of like hit books, whether they have media tie-ins or not. There's just like this appetite for fantasy. 
Whereas, you know, other than like a very niche audience, there's really not that same appetite for sort of planet, not as there once was in the yeah. 40s. Yeah. Um, is it a genre that could be could, like, number one, is it possible to save it? And if it was possible to save it, what would have to happen? Well, I mean, and that, I, say that, that, I just mean like make it more popular because it, it's being saved in the sense that the books are still out there. People can still read them. I mean, it's a great question. I mean, like, here's the thing. The virtue to me of the sword and planet stuff is, and again, it's not just sword and planet, sword and sorcery. And even like the older fantasy stuff was that it's, uh, I won't say more easily digestible, but you know, those slimmer books, you know what I mean? It's less of like a commitment. You know what I mean? Like if I, everyone told me how great the new Patrick Rothfuss book, like name of the wind was. And of course it's another one of these big honking books. And it's kind of like, quite honestly, like based on my life between work, my kids, you know, school, et cetera. I don't know how much time I have available to commit to some huge book, you know, but I can, I can pick up like the moon of skulls by Robert E. Howard. And it's like this slim little, you know, Solomon Kane, paperback right I'd probably knock it out inside of a day or two it's interesting though i think you're you're the opposite of a lot of people my wife just said to her friend, she's watching this series called heartland which is like 15 seasons it's like a canadian show about horse farmers or whatever. right and um they're like oh her and her friend were talking about how they dread the day you know like, oh it's always sucks when you're you're done with your show because then you have to find a new show and i'm kind of like if i saw something that was 15 seasons i'd be like uh i'm not gonna get through 15 seasons <laughs> and i wouldn't even start yeah she's the opposite like oh great 15 seasons like something and i've read that about book publishers that you know they don't want to consider if it's not a trilogy right books have to be these and i don't know if it's because the audience is like well if i'm going to pay the same eight dollars for yeah i want like you know i want the whopper i don't want the you know quarter pounder yeah right i i I, I always want to yeah i want the big mac i don't want the you know single with cheese or whatever right yeah yeah and i mean that could be it but the thing is is like here's the thing. If you talk about like how people have diminished attention spans, et cetera. Now you talk about how kids are so hard to wean away from screens and video games and social media. It's like, what is going to be easier for them to like latch onto like this book or this book? Well, those Harry Potter books. Not, yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. I mean, like, I I think the thing you have to ask though, is like reading is not something that most people want to do no matter how thick the book is. Yeah. So you gotta like you're you kind of gotta play to the people that actually do read the books. Yeah, and yeah. they're a different breed, you know. So you're kind of starting with the idea that like, well, people, you know, I'm gonna try to get people who don't want to read to read. They're not gonna read, but granted, read what kind? What do they want to do? So what would the answer be? Like a trilogy of big honking fat sword and planet? I mean, I, I'm not opposed to that idea. I think that there's something there to it, but I think that the premise would have to be have all of the stuff that we're talking about but be done in some kind of fundamentally different like manner i think that um you know there would have to be enough of like it has to be a vague enough character to allow for reader insertion like into that particular role but i think that maybe they would have to have a little bit more of a personality you know here's the thing the reason i bring this up is because so many genres have been uh watchmen you know where it's been You've had people like, let's say the sword and sorcery genre, right? You have Conan. Yeah. Like, or then you have Jarell Joyery. Oh, let's make a female the lead. And yeah. Have, let's make a weak sorcerer the lead. And then like, it's just like all these other genres, they've been like, let's play, let's, let's flip, flip it on its head. Yeah. Over and over with sword and plan. It seems like it's, it's never been flipped on its ear. It's always the same thing. It's always the John Carter mold. Yeah. So even having something as simple as like a female wakes up on Mars instead of like a male, that alone would be revolutionary. Or yeah, the, that's that has people. happened relatively recently. I think the series, I have not read it myself, but it's called a uh, Jane Carver of War, like W-A-A-R. Oh, okay, so there you go. I mean, but so obviously we're not the only ones to think about it, but right. You know, it just it seems like it's a genre ripe for um what's the word? Revision. Exploitation, innovation, you know. I mean innovation, revisionism yeah. or uh well, it's like where, you know, it's kind of what Alan Moore did with Watch where he's just, he, he's just saying, let's take the tropes and put them on their ear. Well, I mean, all right, all right, so here's the look thing. at them realistically, yeah. you know, if, if you want to watch a minute, here you go. I mean, and this is my pitch. I am probably not the guy to write this because I don't know if I could approach it with, you know, like, I don't have like the lived experiences and the background to like really 
like embrace it, right? But here, here you go. You want a watch minute. It's simple. You take it back to its roots and you completely invert it. It's not a Confederate soldier on the run from Indians. It's an escaped slave on the run from Confederate slave catchers. Right. And, and he gets to the cave or he gets to the device or the alien tech or he meets the friendly Indian shaman or whatever in the hell it happens to be. And he gets transported to this other planet. And now he's not powerless. Now he's not like victimized. He's the one with super strength. He's the one with the leaping and the sword fighting or whatever. Right, right, it's, right. it's Django on Mars. Right. And the thing is, is that because he has these powers, he's not acquiescing and adapting to and living within this identical power structure of exploitation and enslavement he's like no fuck that i left earth and earth is like that and earth is a hellscape you know like now that i've got the power man i'm gonna completely upend your entire fucking social structure i'm not gonna be warlord of mars and embrace like all of your fucked up like traditions i'm gonna upend everything and i'm gonna free the oppressed on your planet and then you know like whatever i mean like see it's interesting because I, I would invert it, but my inversion is a different one. The one I've had in my head for years is, let's say he is the Confederate. It didn't have to be the Confederate. Right. Instead of kind of coming into your glory, you're going to be treated like an actual foreigner from a foreign land who doesn't right. speak language and lands in a, in a new world. Like how would, you know, to me, I, I always said to you, like, to me, imagining John Carter coming onto that planet and being appointed warlord is like imagining an Asian person or a Native American person or a black person coming into Europe, uniting all the European nations yeah. in the Middle Ages and, be yeah. and being appointed the overlord of Europe. Right. Preposterous. Yeah. It would never happen. And so like what would actually happen, you know, if you were, you know, a person of a minority group who had the powers, you right. still have the powers, that's why you're able to survive, you know, and I guess he would have to become like a, a gun for hire or he would just be like kind of working in the, uh, what's the word, like the, underground railroad yeah. bars or something you know, it would have to be something more along those lines but we had the same idea like yeah. take the, the kind of colonialist i guess you could say fantasy of it and flip it on its head so where you're having like the slave become empowered i'm having the confederate experiencing the slave experience, yeah. Yeah. experience. well I, I, you know and the thing is is that there is like you know I mean, Norman does that with some of his stuff because, of course, like the hero, they're like because slavery is such a like a the BDSM component of his world is so prevalent. <laughs> prevalent, you know, the hero always winds up getting you know thrown in chains and enslaved at some point. But it's like with Norman, it was interesting, you know, not necessarily admirable, but interesting because the guy comes from Earth and he has like an Earth mindset. Right. right. So he's shocked by these customs and even like reticent to embrace them. And then like the longer the book series goes on, like the, you know, the hero becomes acclimated and functionally corrupted. He winds up embracing, you know, like the worldview of like this planet. And you would think that, you know, in a more conventional mindset and in a more conventional book, you know, there would be this, you know, however implausible it might seem to us that that's where the nature of having the powers comes from coming into this environment to where you are the fish out of water. You are like the foreigner or the interloper, but you have the power you have like the super strength. You have like the ability to whip the ass of like any weird alien creature that like messes with you. And that like is what enables you to kind of do what is and that's where the fantasy component comes into right. it you know it, it is a wish fulfillment it's like yeah you can't write these wrongs on earth but you can write the wrongs on this other planet in this book because you know it's like it's a book the good guys win you know whereas we're still dealing with like the same fucked up like shit that's been going on for like what centuries <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know? there, there is a naivete to like just, you know not only with that but like all like a lot of adventure fiction superhero fiction everything of i'm gonna fix the world with these two hands right here. yeah yeah you know whereas it would take an army of hands you know right like, and even that wouldn't do it as yeah. human history has shown yeah people being people it's unfortunate but that's but that is why people love these genres that is why people gravitate towards these sorts of stories because However, however naive it is, you know, people want 
to believe it's possible to affect change. People want yeah. to believe that like chivalry and, you know, doing the right thing is possible. People want to believe that the false idols can be overthrown, you know? Right. And, and that's, that's, you know, that that's why like, you know, dumbasses like me are still reading this stuff, you know, <laughs> like, I mean, I, I'm a grown, I mean, I'm a grown man. It's been three decades or more since I read my first John Carter book, you know, and it's like, I'm still kind of chasing that first high, you know, that first kind yeah. of, you know, experience of like, yeah, this like other world. I mean, Ray Bradbury, who wrote his own series of Mars stuff, which he agreed was more science fictional and a little more grounded. You know, that's the perfect thing for a 10 year old read John Carter on Mars. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? It's going to open up this like world of possibilities to you. And that's why we're talking about it now. That's why we want to do a podcast about it. That's why we want to, you know, kind of, I'm curious what other people think about it. I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I think the unfortunate reality though, is that um, a lot of those cultural things that, you know, really make it a, an objectionable work in a lot of ways, which are hundred percent valid. Um, make it difficult, you know, like, could I really recommend, you know, I, one of my best friends is black. Could I really wholeheartedly recommend like the Tarzan series to him even? No, not really. It's, no. it's you know, it's got all these great benefits, or not benefits, but it's all, all these great qualities, but the flaw is so deep and so fundamental in the work. It's objectionable, you know, and it's, yeah. it's hard to, that's, I think the, the hard part about all this kind of stuff is like that, you know, you, these are things that can't be ignored and shouldn't be ignored. And at the same time, there are qualities that affected pop culture then yeah. today. Um, they're, you know, it, it makes it such a hard thing to have a relationship with it, you know, in the 2000s. Well, I mean, th this is the challenge of our time. It's not just the media. It's not just the stories. I mean, this is the political reality of what we live in. You know, it's like how to preserve the good and expiate the foundational sin, right? You know, and and maybe maybe the only way to do that is like you're talking about reinvent the genre, come up with something new. It's like, is it easier to save John Carter, or is it just easier to write your own thing? You know, is it easier? Well, I mean, that's is that what Star Wars is now? You know, I mean, it's not really Sword and Planet, but does yeah. it scratch enough of the Sword and Planet itch that you don't really that it's made a return to that specific genre obsolete? 